One piece of the lecture from yesterday that I kind of skipped over is a page four here, and I wanted just to kind of go over it, especially those that are interested in looking at solubility specifically and what factors drive solubility. Uh, this is something that won't be necessarily needed for you to on, the net, on the test for this unit, but it's additional information for those of you taking the AP Chemistry uh, next year or the following year. It's vital information for you just to be aware of um, because, again, I gloss over it more in AP. It's something I expect you to kind of have good working knowledge of going into it. Now, with solubility, some students, or you might have heard before, is the solubility rule. It's really not a rule, it's a generalization. And that states that like dissolves like. Substances that are polar dissolve things that are polar. Nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. Oil and water, we know, do not mix. And that's because we should know that water is polar, oil is nonpolar. And since they are not like, they don't have similar polarities, they will not dissolve in each other, okay? And therefore, they don't mix. They're immiscible liquids. They do not mix. They layer on top of each other. Why? IMFs. Substances that share similar IMFs, that have similar types of IMFs, will have more attraction for each other, and therefore, they're more soluble in each other. So if you're asked a polarity, a solubility question, will this dissolve into this, what you want to look at is for molecules is if they're polar or nonpolar. Okay, so in this top table up here, iodine, which I've drawn below for you, is I2. It's bonded to itself. A nonmetal bonded to itself is nonpolar. Water, we already know or should know that it's polar. Since they are opposite, the observation is that they will not dissolve. Okay, so the observation here is dissolving. Will these dissolve or will they be miscible where they'll form one phase? And water and iodine will not. They will stay separated. Okay, iodine, next cut, still nonpolar. Hexane is down below. Hexane is a hydrocarbon. When you have only carbon hydrogen bonded together, these compounds are by rule defined as nonpolar through sim symmetry arguments. And therefore, we have both nonpolar, so yes, we will see hexane dissolve iodine. Okay, and this trend would just continue. Um, the next one is hexane and water. Hexane's nonpolar, water's polar. No. So if you want to complete, stop the presentation now, complete the table, and then hit back, I'll go through the rest of the answers. Hexane is nonpolar. Ethanol is down below. Ethanol ends in OL, all from the one lab that we did. It has an OH group, a hydroxide group. And because there's an H bonded to O, remember the good old rule. Is the hydrogen having fawn? It is, and therefore ethanol is a polar material. So no, it will not dissolve. Water and ethanol are both polar, so they will be soluble in each other. And lastly, what about salt? Salt is an ionic compound of sodium chloride. For ionic compounds, there is a table of solubility on your chem helper. It's the very top table located across the top of your chem, chem helper, and you can look up any material on that table to see if it's soluble in water. There is a yes, there's a soluble column row, I should say, going across, and there's a not soluble row. What you have to do is identify and match up which column. The columns above are labeled with the anion, so you want to find chloride, and then drop below and look at the two columns. And it will tell you which substances are insoluble chlorides and which ones are soluble chlorides. So you, from there, you can just figure, okay, based on sodium chloride, which, where does it meet? We should already know of working knowledge that we know that table salt is soluble in water. But you can use this table to see if you can understand how to operate the table to determine if that material is soluble. The other thing you can easily do is because of you working from home, you can always look it up. You can ask, you go to Google and say, is sodium fluoride soluble in water? Is magnesium chloride soluble in water? And very quickly, Google will give you the answer. So here, anything that's ionic, it's not polar, it's ionic. Water is polar. Many things that are ionic are, are soluble in water because ionic compounds have charges. Sodium ions have positive charges, chloride ions have negative charges, and water has got a partial negative end and partial positive end. So this is why water will dissolve polar covalent compounds and water will also dissolve many ionic compounds is because it's attraction of positive negative charges. So this is why we often say water is a universal solvent.
because it can dissolve many, many things. The only thing that doesn't dissolve well in it is nonpolar covalent materials. Okay. All right, so now looking at below, here I've given you again some materials. And now the key question is, will they dissolve in water? So again, pause the lecture and above them write yes or no and see if you can determine if they'll dissolve in water. Again, water is polar. Look at the formulas. If you need to draw the Lewis structure, and from that, ask the key question, is that material polar or nonpolar? And that should tell you the answer. Okay? Sodium fluoride is yes, because you would sodium fluoride is an ionic compound. Therefore, we want to use that table on your chem helper. Most things that contain sodium ions are highly soluble in water, because sodium ions are very soluble in water. Methane is no. If you draw the Lewis structure, it's perfectly symmetric. And therefore, it's nonpolar because of the pop total symmetry. Methanol, CH3OH, is soluble in water because of the OH group. It is a polar material because of that hydroxide. The oxygen has lone pairs. It's asymmetric. Polar dissolves in polar water. CH2Cl2 is also soluble in water. Now, some of you might have said no because when you draw the Lewis structure, you might put the hydrogens across from each other and the chlorines across from each other. But remember, the Lewis structure does not tell you the true shape, the geometry of the molecule. And these chlorides are not across from each other to cancel each other out. So remember the fundamental rule. If the atoms coming off the central atom are not all the same, the substance is asymmetric and therefore polar. Ammonia is soluble in water. Why? It has lone pairs. And the lone pairs of ammonia make it asymmetric and therefore polar. BH3 is not polar and therefore is not soluble with water. BH3, students often forget, boron is hypovalent. It only can form three bonds. It does not have a lone pair and this is a symmetric structure because it has no lone pairs and all the atoms coming off it are the same. So BH3 is not polar in water. So again, questions like this, if they were on the test, you'd want to be able to draw the Lewis structure, identify what um, type of polarity it has to be able to answer the question. The other big driving factor you can see in blue here is what really drives solubility. Now, I did talk a little about IMFs, but with IMFs, there's even another point that goes even to the heart of it even more so, and that is energy. Energy drives all chemical reactions. It also drives all solubility. If energetically it's not favorable, so if energetically the solubility of that material in water is not favorable, it's not going to dissolve. So we have to get more energy out compared to energy coming in. So let's take a look at this picture real quickly. So the solute is sodium chloride, and the solvent is water. And the water, remember, is a liquid, and there's strong intermolecular forces holding it together, specifically hydrogen bonds, but also has LDFs, line dispersion forces, as well. In order for this solution to form, the first thing that must happen, one of the things that has to happen, is the sodium chloride has to break apart into free ions. Breaking a bond apart is endothermic. It takes energy. Energy's got to come in to break that bond apart so that now the ions, the positive negative particles of the sodium chloride, will interact with the water molecules more than themselves. The solvent, the water, has to also separate apart to create spaces for the ions to intermingle with the water molecules. That is breaking IMFs. That too requires energy. So the first step of this, of both solvents or solutes being able to break their IMFs or their bonds, that is an energy in. Now the positive sodium, sodium ions become solvated. Solvated means the water molecules will attract each of the ions surrounding each of the ions because of this attraction. Now what part of water would be attracted to the positive sodium? oxygen would. Now I'm going to draw it as a molecular picture, Mickey Mouse again as we've done before, showing the bigger oxygen is going to be more strongly attracted to the positive sodium ions surrounding those ions. And that causes an interaction, an IMF forms. And that IMF forming is that negative oxygen uh, polarity being attracted to the positive sodium ion. Okay. This is called an ion-dipole relationship, and energy comes out because it is stabilizing the substances. So energy gets released. The chloride ions, the opposite is true. Now, 
the hydrogen's parts of the water surround the chloride because the positive is attracted to the negative and it too becomes solvated. The more strongly attracted water is to these ions, the more soluble the material is, is more so, is soluble in water. And that be, is because more energy comes out. In order for this reaction to occur, for sodium chloride to be soluble in water, we must get more energy out than in. So the amount of energy that comes in to break the ionic bond and to break the dynamic force is water. The amount of energy that comes out from those IMM, IMFs forming between the ions and water must be greater. If it is, then the substance will dissolve in water. And the more energy that comes out, the more soluble the material. Some things are subtly soluble in water and some things are readily soluble in water. Okay, And this is also why solids, as temperature goes up, solubility tends to go up for solids. Because for solids, we have to break that bond. If the water has more energy, if the surroundings have a higher energy, those molecules are given more energy and therefore are able to break that bond more easily. And this is why solids tend to have an increasing solubility as temperature goes up, because there's more energy available to break those intermolecular forces and to break those bonds to get the substance to dissolve in water. Okay, So it all comes down to energy. And that's what these diagrams down below with 1, 2, and 4 are talking about, is what the energy is coming in. Energy 1 is the amount of energy coming in to break the ionic bond. Energy 2 to cause the molecules to separate. And then the energy out to have the intermolecular force form between the ions and the water. So it's all guided by energy. If there's energy, okay, we get more energy out, the substance will be more readily soluble in water. Now, these materials are really not going to be stressed much on this exam and this and the quiz for this week. The quiz this week is going to focus primarily on reading solubility curves. Um, and so I just want you to be aware of these fundamental um, concepts, mainly for those that might be taking AP, but also it gives a good background information as to why. Some of you might have had questions of why is this material soluble in water and this is not. It comes down to energy and these intermolecular forces that are more commonly shared with each other. Thanks for listening.